said you can't turn it while recording. Yeah. It's in your pants. Well, you're recording. Yeah. While you're recording, you can't turn it. It didn't say it over there. Yeah. Good morning. I know we just stand this morning and let's just praise the Lord. Amen. Let him know that we're here. We love him. And there's nothing, nothing on the face of this earth that can hang our praise. Amen. 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 Meditate upon that. 
today as we praise the Lord Jesus. Let us pray. Lord, we are thankful to come into your house. We are thankful for every person that made their way into your house today. Wherever that is across this world, Lord, we're glad for every person that is honoring you by coming into your house. We thank you, Lord, for those who cannot come into the house, truly have a, a reason that they cannot come. We thank you for them joining us or other churches for services live streamed or recorded and seen later in the day or however they join your church. But Lord, we also understand there are many today who just aren't aware of you. Their lives are just so consumed. They just aren't aware of you. And sometimes we fear they aren't aware of you for days or weeks or months at a time. And Lord, we ask that you would help them to comprehend the world is changing and they need a stability in this world. And the stability's name is Jesus. You are that only place. You, the Holy Spirit, the Father, you are that only place that is the same yesterday and today and forevermore. You don't change. Your rules don't change. Your personality doesn't change. Your love doesn't change. So we ask today that you would reach down among us and help those of us who are awake to stay awake and help those who are sleeping to be a something, something to arouse their heart, their soul, their mind. We ask this, Lord, as we ask for your blessings in our worships today, in the name of Jesus.
following the service this morning. And in your bulletin, you should have insert me that you know about the holiness summit that's coming up this evening and the first part of this week. And just tune into that and make sure that uh, you make yourself available to that and be a part of it. And God just work in your life. Take every opportunity that He's given you to spend time in the Lord. You have a deep, long, long life.
So it's called stewardship. I say pay my money, it's stewardship. I kept my money. So I think what John is, is saying to us without actually saying. We just take care of business today. Is if we could just give a little extra to the kid offering today, if we had that, that, that would go. The kid offering. Yeah. 
seems like a lifetime since we've all been back in that. I just, I'm so thankful to be able to, to be back in the house of the Lord. It's great to be able to see the services online, but it's just not the same as being with the people. And I just appreciate your prayers. And you 
named a person with a name I couldn't pronounce from a place I'd never been, who was different from me in every way. And you said, Wilma, would you die to keep them out of hell? I wonder. I would like to say yes, I would be willing. It's a question, isn't it? Yes. And then when you go from there and you say, well, I use this person, they're using every kind of vulgar language there is to use. And when you speak to them about it, they laugh and mock. They make fun of Jesus. They make fun of the church. Sexually, they are like an animal with no restraint whatsoever. Their life is so impure that nothing almost condemns them. Would you die for them to keep them out of there? Would you die so they can live another day and hopefully repeat? I'm asking you that question. And then even if we could in our minds say, I think, I know it's the right thing to do, and I think I'm willing. I want to be willing. That if I could keep any person out of hell, whether I ever knew them or heard of them, or if they were a murderer or a rapist or anything that they had ever done, and I could die, to give them a chance to get right. I would like to think I can do that. But even being willing or knowing that that's the right thing, when it came time that that person stepped down and you stepped up, it would take some courage, wouldn't it? Take some strength, it would take some doing. But he realized Jesus did exactly that. He did that. He looked at us when we were the worst we've ever been. The Bible says why we were yet ungodly. You know, he doesn't wait for the best day. We were doing devotions this week and or maybe it was me studying on my own. But anyhow, something came out this week in, in some of my studies. And that is that it, the 99, when you think of a sheep, and you think that the shepherd had a hundred in the fold. And by the way, those of you that are out there live stream, we miss you. We understand that your health is compromised. But we want you to know we love you and we miss you. But the 99 were in the fold. And then the shepherd went out there to find that one that was out of the fold. But have you thought about the fact that if you had five children, now I only have one son, and then I go down the generation. So I have some faith. But if you had five children, and four of them are reasonably safe today, maybe they aren't saved and you're not really looking at the eternal picture, maybe actually they aren't really living close to Christ and they're all in danger. But let's say that four of the five, their everyday life was good. And you look just at the earth. And you said, well, these four are doing pretty good. I guarantee you it would be that fifth one you'd go to bed with on your mind. Wake up with on your mind. The one that was in trouble, that was in such trouble you didn't know what was going to happen with them. It's the one that's out there that you think is in trouble that tends to stay on your mind because the ones that are close, you can see and you can know they're okay, or you think they're okay. Do you know, sometimes you and I think in terms of our family, 
families. We think in terms of them, of do they have a house? Do they have a car? Do they have a job or some kind of income? We might go so far as to think about them, do they have activities they like? Are they having fun in life? But if you and I ask ourselves today, how many of our families really do not know the Lord Jesus Christ? They're not excited about coming to church. They're not excited about reading Bible. Very seldom does a Bible discussion go on in the family because they're just not interested. We may have more people that we need to be striving over than what we think. Just because we have a house and a car and a job and can go buy stuff, that doesn't mean whether or not we're actually walking with the Lord and ready to go home and be easy call. And I, I would like us to think in those terms of that. Sometimes when a message like the is on my heart today, I start thinking about what is available to our families. And many families are getting far from, far from being a, a it's church time, let's all get ready, let's go to the house of the Lord. Many families are getting far from teaching the children the, the stories of the Old Testament, the stories of the New Testament. We're getting far from teaching our children all those little songs so that they can sing them. We're getting far from, this is a fact nobody wants to hear. The generation that paid tithes is passing. And the generations coming on are not as faithful to paying tithes. That tells you more churches and more ministries will have to close. So today, is the subject that I have on my heart is the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus. I, I want to read to you just a verse or two. I, I thought I would read more, but I may go deeper into that later. Maybe tonight. In John, the sixth chapter, the verses 53 and 54, Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life. And I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. And he goes ahead and he talks about the, the fact that his blood and his body. When you think about the blood of Jesus Christ, It's such a huge subject, and I thank you for your kind attention. I really do want to share some things with you about this today. The blood of Jesus Christ. You know, when you think about the blood, just your blood running around in your body right now, the blood that's going through your heart, your lungs, going out making your fingertips ache. Going out and making your toes able to move. Because your blood it is just being circulated all over your body. But you know, everything that you're circulating, or almost well, everything that you're circulating inside your blood, came out of the dirt. You are still made from dirt. We often think it was just Adam and Eve made from dirt. But I can tell you, this old girl has made a lot of wheat and corn and beans of all kinds. 
milk that came from the grass, steak, hamburger, pork chops. I'm not naming anything that you're not smiling about because you're made of dirt too, aren't you? You know, the Lord made a, he made such a, such a special thing. He is, he is such an awesome being. Who but the Lord would be able to take the things of the earth and make a human and then breathe into that human and let it get up, having been made out of the dirt, and then become so creative that he gives us everything from strawberries to apples to eat to get more dirt to fill our bodies and take care of our bodies. Who but the good Lord would let us have some, at this time of year, go get some nice fresh lettuce. You really have to be country to enjoy this. And some really tender onions and cut them up together and put a little, I see some of them here and there. Uh, and put a little bit of oil, a little bit of um, vinegar or whatever you like. And then mix some of that corn that was grown out there in the field that's been ground up with a few other things and make some cornbread and put with that. <laughs> Got some pretty good ways to keep this whole body going. But the Lord designed us out of the dirt and then said, you're going to need dirt to eat to keep your body flowing. That's how your body's a little dry. And then he designed that the mother, while carrying a baby, he had all of that stuff that we need, minerals, vitamins, potassium, whatever, he sends it in route through our bodies. It travels without you or me even having to mention or think of it. Here comes a river of nutrients, vitamins, fruits, vegetables, steak, potatoes, and while that mother has that baby in the womb, that river of blood is giving life to that baby and making that baby. And then all of our days, the blood is our life. The blood is our life. I read not too long ago, as we were thinking about going to the beach, and I, I was just reading some things on the beach, I read where a, a young man almost bled to death because of a shark bite. Just a nice, big, healthy, young, 20-some year old young man out on a surfboard. They think the shark mistook him for a seal, like they would know. But anyhow, they think the shark thought that. I always think those are cute when they tell me what sharks think. <laughs> but uh, here they come up and he grabs it and, and, uh, and, and got the boy and just tore a uh, big hunk right out of the boy's thigh. And he, he cut an artery. And they were very concerned. And they even flew in helicopters. They were moving, as you would say, heaven and earth to get something there to take care of that boy because his life was leaking from him. The blood is life. And then you think about the blood of Jesus Christ. We know that in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve made a covenant with the devil. And the covenant was, I'm going to eat this. It's a tree of good and evil, and I'm going to bring evil on me. And it's a tree that if I've been told if I eat death, it's going to come on the human race. But it really looks good, and I have no self-control, so I think I'll eat it. And so we've got a covenant upon the human race. And that covenant was that all should not. And after that, the judgment. And not one of us Gentiles, not one of us Gentiles, even to say we were out of anger, we would have been lost. We had no way whatsoever to get to heaven. Nothing. And Jesus looked down 
And God the Father looked down, and in the book of Hebrews, it said that Jesus agreed, or that Jesus said, I will become lower than the angels. I will become lower than man, in whom we turn the whole earth over to man. I will become the sacrifice. I will go. The Son of God left his place and came to earth. On the one side, he was the Son of God. And the Hebrews tell you he kept his priesthood. That's why you're so drawn to him. His priesthood. He still could speak the word of God and it had authority and power. He could still heal. He could still say to a disease, leave. And the disease left. He could still say to the devil, you know who I am and I know who you are. But he didn't have to do all that. All he had to do was say, go. And the devil had to leave. He kept his God side but on this side, the Son of God said, I will come out of Abraham, out of Isaac, out of Jacob, out of Judah, boom, 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 out of David, boom, 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 out of Mary. On this side, I'm the Son of God. I'm the high priest. On this side, I will become a mere mortal. And I will shed my blood. I will give my body. I am willing. Now I ask you, do you think you could be willing to do that? When Jesus came here, all through the eon, all through the thousands of years of the Old Testament, Jesus knew he and become a mortal. All through those years he knew that mortal would finally teach and preach and come to the place that he would be killed for the sins of the world. We talk about the blood being life. The Bible tells you there is no remission of sin without blood. And it takes innocent blood. Innocent blood. Jesus was the only human, human God. He was the only human who ever could come here and resist temptation and stay cool. He was the only one worthy to become the Son of God's Savior, the Son of God Christ. The anointed one, the Savior. And when he looked all of us, and he looked into the world at how dark and horrible it would be, he still said, I will give my life that they can have a choice to believe. I will give my body. I will give my blood. And at his last supper, he symbolically did that, didn't he? And, and it's offered to Christians. And, and it tells you here, it's a, it's a serious offering. Jesus said, except you eat my body and drink my blood. Symbolically, you've got to take Jesus into you. You have to take Jesus into you. But more than that, you've got to open your heart and let Jesus come in. You have to come to him and repent. You have to let him come in and live within you. You have to let the Holy Spirit come and live within you. You have to let that make a difference in you. But Jesus not only was willing, but he did. He did. Have you ever paid a debt someone else owed? Most of us have 
in some way, don't they? I remember through my years paying debts that I didn't know. But I also remember people coming to my aid when other people didn't pay too. My first lesson that people didn't keep their word was one of, of such simplicity. And I know now that my mother probably danced through the kitchen thinking, I can teach Wilma here. There was a neighbor lady who wanted someone in the day before all the pesticides and all the miracle cure, wanted someone to get potato bugs off of her potatoes. <laughs> and she was offering real money. It was like a quarter for doing it for a week. <laughs> I mean, a quarter back then is buying you six pops. Six candy bars or some BBs thrown in there, too. And I went every morning faithfully. Now, my mother knew this lady wasn't going to pay me. She knew the unfaithfulness of this lady. And every morning I'd pop out of bed and I'd go get me a bucket and I'd go to that potato field and I would take off all those potato bugs. And I would bring them home and kill them. Eat the bucket. Make sure they couldn't get anybody else to eat. At the end of the week, I was like wearing a smile that was bigger than me. It was payday. I go up to the door, knock on the door, and I said, I've done it five days and I hardly found any today. I think I've got it mostly off. She said, you know what? I don't have any change. I said, I can run down to the store and get you some change. I mean, I'm wanting to get paid, right? I'm a little kid. I said, I can run down to the store and get you change if it was there when we didn't have it. And she said, I just don't really have anything I could give you that could, oh, I've got like five or ten, I don't want to send a little child like that. I'll give it to you in a day or two. And I thought that day or two, and Mom let me make that out. I thought that day or two was like four or five years. So finally the next week, I said, can I go up there and knock on her door and ask her for my money? She said, you can one time. I went up, I got myself all ready, I knocked on that door, and I said, I came to get my quarter. I'm really wanting to spend it. <laughs> and she said, I forgot to get changed. And you know, about the time I got home, I think my smile was dragging the ground upside down. And Mom said, Wilma, what have you learned? And I said, Mom, I've learned you shouldn't be a crook. <laughs> she said, do you think that lady is a crook? I said, I do think she's a crook. I don't think she's going to pay me. And mom said, here's your point. You, you pay for a really good lesson. Everybody doesn't keep their work. Everybody doesn't do what they ought to do. <clears throat> Pardon me. Mom paid that debt that she did not. The mom's motives were much, much, much bigger than getting potato bugs off of a potato. Mom's motives were that I've learned. And you know, Jesus has had to discover those kinds of things about every one of us, hasn't he? I mean, maybe we don't cheat kids. But every one of us has seen I mean, he's had to learn that we don't always keep our word. Or do we lose 10 pounds? By June. By July! <laughs> By December! <laughs> I mean, we just don't keep our word. And then he has to stand by sometimes while people literally curse him. You know, when he was in the garden praying, no doubt he was partly praying because he knew I have to literally stand there. I mean, he wanted to do it, or he didn't have to do it. He could have called angels, and we would have never read about the price of Calvary. But he, he stood, he had to pray. Lord, help me stand there and pray for all of them as I'm 
beard, as you're slapping me, Lord, as, they, as I lay my hands down there for them to nail them, as I put my feet there for them to nail them, Lord, help me. Father, you're going to have to help me. I do want to give my life away. I don't want them to go to hell. I do see their faults. I see faults just in the last days. I watched Pilate betray me. He knew who I was, but he wouldn't stand up. I, I watched people see me. And I know I'll have to watch it until you call me to come back the second time to get the church. I'll have to watch people see me. I'll have to stand and watch them do horrible things. But I still will give my life for them. I want them to have a chance to call out on my name and that my blood, which was shed on Calvary, can wash their black sins and make that red blood over that black sin and make them white snow. That they can claim the blood of Calvary the blood of the sinless lamb. They can claim the blood then, and let that innocent blood give life. But it will give eternal life. It will give life abundant here and it will give eternal life forever. I want them to be able to eat my flesh. Drink my blood. I want them to be able to claim the sacrificial lamb of and he did it. I've often thought, having had bad lungs all of my life, I have often thought when they put that, stuck the bottom of that cross in a hole, this is the only way I can figure they would have done it, stuck that cross in a hole, and then started lifting it, men lifting it with the weight and the weight of Jesus and probably had something strung over like a rope or something to pull the other way too. And finally, when the cross got upright, <clears throat> his body would have fell on those nails. And there he hung for hours. And the only way that he could get a breath was to push up on nailed legs and pull on nailed hands and stood up an old tree to get a good breath. That's why they broke their legs when it got close to the end of the day and close to the end of the Sabbath. They would come and they would break the legs of the people on the crosses so they couldn't push up and get a breath and they would die. But Jesus prophecy had said they'll not break his bones. So Jesus, when they got close, gave his soul into the hands of his father and gave up the ghost and died. So when they came around to break the legs, they did not need to break Jesus' legs. But one of the soldiers wanted to make sure he was dead. So he got his spear and he walked over to the cross and he jabbed the Lord in the side to make sure he was dead. And out came the blood and water. Jesus thought you were worth dying. That's what I was. You know, sometimes when I see how my fellow humans are acting, times in my life, I wish Jesus could instantly be shown on a cross there in the middle of all that so that they could see I need to look up here at the Lord and how he loved me. And I, I need to accept Jesus as my Savior. The blood of Christ 
it's, it's, it's his gift to us. And if we claim the death, the burial, and the resurrection, if we take his body and his blood as ours, he said, you not only will live good here, but I will raise you up at the last day. That's we get a song. There's lots of things in the book of Hebrews that I didn't really get to. But the Lord talks quite a bit about the priesthood of heaven in Hebrews. And he talks about the fact that he became our mediator. And there's a word, and I may not pronounce it right, But you know that this part of the book, you know what this first part of the book is called, don't you know? What's it called? Scream it to me. The Pentateuch and the Pentateuch and all 39, what are they called? Old Testament. What's this part over here called? New Testament. And when you go to the attorney sometimes, you get a last will and testament made. When Jesus died on the cross, he became the testator. He was the one who made the last will and testament for us. Why it's called a new testament, a new will and testament, the way we think of it. You can't, you don't inherit from a will until people die. Jesus died. And we can inherit eternal life. As we see, if anybody would like to pray, there's plenty of safe places to pray. You don't know Jesus coming asking in your heart. I